Shipper's Log, Stardate 253.1. Captain James T. Kirk, in charge of the USS Enterprise. We've entered an unknown region of space, orbiting a planet known as Antares 7. We've been in contact with the natives and creatures of the planet who have requested that me and Mr. Spock beam down to the surface of the planet in hopes that, in their own words, they may get off. We're not entirely sure what getting off means, however, we've run it through the Universal Translator with no success. For safety reasons, we'll be beaming down to the planet with Security Red Shirt Officer Ensign Cadaver, and we hope that this meeting will become a mutual one. Shipping the fandom frontier. These are the stories about the captain and the crew of the USS Enterprise, whose continuing mission to explore strange new tropes, to seek out new kinks and ways to be bonded, to boldly go where many fans have gone before, has brought you right here to Shipper's Guide to the Galaxy, to the much requested ship of Captain Kirk and First Officer Mr. Spock, K S, or Spurk as it is sometimes called here in the current at the time of this recording era of portmanteau names. Most people are aware of this ship, even if they are not actively involved in fandom, for Kirk and Spock are special, and it's time to find out why. Star Trek in the year of 2016 is celebrating its 50th anniversary. This sci-fi phenomenon has become a cultural landmark, far surpassing initial expectations, especially given its lackluster ratings when it first aired. It was in syndication during the 70s that this show really burst into mainstream popularity, but that's not to say there weren't already dedicated fans engaged in an activity that would come to be revolutionary. When fans began writing about the continued, oftentimes erotic adventures of Kirk and Spock, they began to solidify the practice we currently know as shipping. For it is postulated by scholars and fans of fan culture alike that Kirk and Spock are the first official slash, as it was more commonly called a mere few decades ago, pairing. Now, they were not the first. People were writing fiction about Napoleon and Ilya Kuryakin from The Man from Uncle during this time period as well, as well as for some other shows. But the Star Trek fandom came to organize itself around this activity in a way that had never been seen before. So let's set the scene. It's the late 60s. You're a fan, and you feel the urge, that itch, to keep a story going. So you write one. But now what do you do with it? Enter not only the sharing circle amongst friends, but the fanzine. Fanzines can be defined as a non-professional and non-official publication produced by fans of a particular cultural phenomenon for the pleasure of others who share their interest. Fanzines can be traced back to the 19th century and start out in the sci-fi genre, for example, for people who loved authors such as Lovecraft. Though in its earliest incarnation, it was academic, people writing papers about the themes and motifs contained within said work and what they implied. Over time, however, it began to shift and transform to something more fun, and much less scholarly, revolving around the creation of new stories surrounding the original works. This occurred throughout the 20s through the 40s and eventually leading into the Star Trek era. These fanzines were circulated through the mailing service by subscription, much like a regular magazine, though the publishers most often received little to no compensation. Sometimes in lieu of payment, subscribers could also be contributors, submitting stories or art for the very magazine they would eventually receive. Printings were limited, and you had to be in the know to get involved, since fandom was still so niche and still had that aura of the taboo. Star Trek and the pairing of Kirk and Spock are unique in that it would become the first time a fandom would grow around this fanzine format, spreading itself to the point where there were independent fanzines dedicated to nothing but Kirk and Spock stories, something that before this pairing would have been unheard of. Back in the late 60s, early 70s, many stories were written and then passed around by friends, sometimes finding their way into zines without the original author's consent. It is thus difficult to pinpoint the first Kirk and Spock story, but academics have suggested that it may be The Ring of Sochern, a 40-page novella written by Jennifer Guttridge, published in Alien Brothers without her consent. The community surrounding these fanfics and zines was largely made up of housewives and those who had the time to dedicate to the creation of intricate stories and meetings for fan clubs and just while getting together in general. All things that take time, as anybody active in a fan community to this day can tell you. But what was it specifically about these two that ignited the imagination of the populous so. Well, at the heart of Star Trek lies the relationship between Kirk and Spock. Their friendship is highlighted within the show's canon throughout its entire run, with it being quite clear that the two would do anything for each other. They share a bond, an unspoken understanding few friends can ever hope to achieve, in a quiet but understood thread that is ever-present even when it is not verbally acknowledged. And this deep-seated friendship was no accident. When Star Trek first aired, it had been built to be a vehicle surrounding the character of Captain Kirk. Creator Gene Roddenberry, as well as the actor himself, himself and producers believed that fans, both male and female, would gravitate naturally towards the dashing brash captain. However, when the show began airing, 
a different reality presented itself. The second-in-command Spock became the breakout character, and this had to be rectified, especially since William Shatner, Kirk's actor, was being paid top billing. When Roddenberry asked for suggestions as to how to rectify this, Isaac Asimov, yes, I, Robot Isaac Asimov, suggested that the scripts should seek to make Spock and Kirk synonymous with each other. Spock should regularly save Kirk's life, and the two should be depicted as joined at the hip. That way, when fans saw Spock, they would automatically associate him with Kirk and vice versa, boosting Kirk's popularity by association. So that closeness is not imagined, and it is very deliberate, and fans were quick to pick up on it. From the outset, Slash stories were not the only stories written, and the Slash could also represent friendship. But as the genre developed, the romantic fiction began to overwhelm the platonic by a significant margin, creating one of the first ever shipping wars between fans who did not buy what at the time was referred to as the premise. The premise being the idea that these two were romantically involved. So there were people who supported the premise, and those who did not. As for canon acknowledgement, well, post-syndication, Star Trek's popularity began to spike, and fans organized themselves, not only with zines, but seeking out convention appearances. And by the 80s, the socio-political climate was such that some fans were bold enough to ask Roddenberry directly for confirmation, to which he had this to say. Yes, there's certainly some of that. Certainly with love overtones. Deep love. The only difference being the Greek ideal. We never suggested in the series, physical love between the two. But it's the, we certainly had the feeling that the affection was sufficient for that, if that were the particular style of the 23rd century. It's very interesting, I never thought of that before. Fan fiction for Kirk and Spock has existed for so long that the pair set up many of the conventions that are still in use today throughout multiple fandoms, and are currently the most academically studied fan fiction pair of all time. There have been essays upon essays discussing this pair's evolution or how Star Trek itself can be considered homoerotic. One of the more interesting theories proposed came from Henry Jenkins, a fan theorist who suggested the idea of convergence. Convergence centering around the phenomenon wherein groups and communities within the online and digital era's participation and engagement with a text exercise their own agency, creating a collective fan intelligence through both approved and unapproved creations of their own with the text, exploring the idea that fans are potentially empowered enough to change the source text itself. Which is fascinating, since the question as to whether a clear and documented fan interest in either a certain pairing or a character can influence how a show's writers and creators mold the story is one that is often asked. Heck, the question came up a fair bit within the comments section of the Korosami video, so it's definitely a subject that could warrant more study, particularly in this day and age when fan culture is so active and so documented. So gathering research would not be as arduous as back in the 70s, when tracking the full scale must have been much more difficult. I, for one, would love to see the studies on what Jenkins deemed participatory media expanded upon, as fan culture has something to say about society. It may be fun and community building, but it is also unique and deserves to be acknowledged as such, not just as a fringe happenstance or joke. So Kirk and Spock, because of all the aforementioned, have numerous essays discussing why they can or cannot be. So let's get into the heart of the matter. Why are Kirk and Spock so shippable as characters? Well, as mentioned, their closeness, but also their contrastingly comparable personalities. Kirk is an assertive and charming man, warm and open, hard on his very often ripped open sleeve. He is dedicated to his friends and to his duty, and carries a secret cache of loneliness that is most oftentimes covered by his responsibilities, but sometimes seeps through. While Spock is logical and seemingly emotionless, keyword seemingly, for he is far from it. Intelligent and boasting of a variety of hobbies, Spock is a bit of an outsider due to his dual heritage and is seeking to belong and be accepted. And it is acceptance that is given without hesitation from Kirk, who accepts him wholeheartedly. The two men share a bond that often crosses over into the telepathic as the two have had to be melded, or Spock has modified Kirk's memories before to give him peace of mind. And his telepathic contact was set up to be the height of intimacy amongst Vulcans, Kirk and Spock literally share the closest bond they could set out by canon. The two touch each other often, which is significant given that Vulcans tend towards valuing their personal space due to the aforementioned telepathic abilities most often touch activated, and Kirk can and has made Spock's emotional control break several times. The two characters' closeness is also acknowledged by most around them in the text, even by certain alien races they encounter. Their relationship, friendship or otherwise, is respectfully and lovingly documented, and 
this focus drew many non-sci-fi fans as well as science fiction fans to this pairing, which expanded the types of works being written about them away from just an episodic focus, and pushed it more towards the relationship focus. Fiction for this pairing has existed for so long that the fandom itself has become self-aware, and actually had a crisis in the 80s when there was a rise of BDSM fiction that many fans at the time found to be deviant, and many felt that they were simply getting kinkier and not more creative. For certain tropes were just being repeated over and over again. For example, one that gets repeated even to this day, Spock goes into Ponfar, has not come out of it, or it was not complete post a mock time, and he needs to mate or die. Enter Captain James T. Kirk to the rescue. Captain's log, start at 26531. Spock is currently suffering from the Ponfar, which is a reproductive cycle of the Vulcan species. He is currently experiencing great pain and anger, and therefore he must mate or he will surely die. That or he will tear the ship apart from the inside out. As captain of the ship, it is my duty to her and her crew, so therefore I have volunteered myself as a mating subject. Now I must go to my quarters and prepare. Kirk out. Okay, so why might you not ship it, even with its huge mountain of history and massive fan following, to the point that Kirk and Spock fix take up 90% of the fandom as a whole? And with the focus remaining ostensibly on these two, even with the pushing of the spock or her romance to the forefront, this has not changed even in the modern era with the reboots. Actually, the way the two timelines merge in fic writers' minds is quite, dare I say it, fascinating. But alas, a discussion for another day. So why aren't they shipped? Well, let's not throw Gen Fickers under the bus. When it comes to shows such as this, or any really, some people like to keep things platonic and focus on adventures or expanded storylines. Some see them as friends, or as romantic yet asexual lovers, or some other combination along the asexuality or aromantic spectrums. Perhaps you like Kirk gallivanting across the galaxy to boldly screw who no man has screwed before, which while crass, let's not lie, some episodes went down like that. There are just as many good tales to tell with these two men as dear close friends as there are of them together. Thankfully, the days of K-slash-S wars are long behind us, and like the eugenics wars, let's leave them there. The bottom line is lovers are friends, Kirk and Spock are amazing characters, whose adventures will continue on for as long as there is Trek. They are the flagship pairing of all fandom, laying the groundwork for the evolution of the communities we now frequent and enjoy. So whether you ship them or not, they are historically significant to fan culture in itself. If you're not into Star Trek, or can't deal with the acting and effects from shows back in the day, you may not have seen these two in action in their heyday, so you know what it's time for. For shippable moments, or in this case, since the whole show is a shippable moment, episodes for Kirk and Spock. Bonus points to me, because I low-key ship Spock and McCoy, so I get double the action. But then again, I also ship Deanna Troy with this one Vulcan she met in a Star Trek TNG tie-in novel. There's no hope for me. As for the reboots, Kirk and Spock's characters have not really changed that much. Spock is a bit more openly emotional and accepting of his dual nature, and Kirk is far more brash and irresponsible, but they've gelled much the same way. Though it does suffer a bit from fans having to carry over their knowledge of how close these two were from the original series, since the films still need to work a little harder at earning the big moments they have between their characters. Fix and art about these two cover anything you've seen in modern day slash fiction. As for how these two blew up, these were some of the circumstances surrounding surrounding it. But to understand how it truly happened, sometimes things just align in just the right way at just the right moment. And here we are celebrating 50 years with these fantastic characters, a third film in the reboot franchise to excite us again at the time of this recording, and a new Star Trek series on the current horizon. It's a great time to be a fan when works can so easily be created and shared. It's really a gift. So thank you, Kirk and Spock. Live long and prosper. Are you guys Kirk and Spock shippers, or is there another TOS pairing in your sights? Also, please request all the Star Trek pairings. I'm just waiting for an excuse. Any excuse. Also, special thanks to Dave Walpole from the channel of the same name for doing his Kirk voice for me. He busted it out when I told him I was doing an episode on this, and I knew I had to have him do it. Check him out, he's really funny, and his How Not To series and Krylo Ren series are just a lot of fun. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Check out social media to stay up to date, and as always, stay tuned, for there are as many ships out there as there are stars in the sky.